Good morning. Stop. No, keep going. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So good to see you today. Good to be back with you. Some of you have joined this church. You started attending over the summer, and you're like, who's that short, bald dude up there? My name is Scott Hamilton. I am a co-pastor here with Rob Dunning. And so uh, I've been on a three-month sabbatical and came back, and I was so happy that my key still fit the door. <laughs> my codes still work. I can still get in the building and so forth, so I was very happy about that. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but I was informed that my stunt double recently arrived at Foundation Church. Do you know about that? He's actually in Next Steps, next door. His name is Scott Hamilton. Can you believe that? I was like, surely not. Surely, no. But yeah, Scott Hamilton is next door in Next Steps, he and his wife, and he's, I guess they're going to join the church, so I don't, I don't know what that means from here on out. I, I asked him, he sat right there this morning, I said, Are you, I'm, I'm feeling a little scratchy, would you come and relieve me? He, he said no. So anyway, but it is very good to be with you, so glad that you had such a good summer. I, I uh, took off from, in May, and I didn't look back, not because I don't love this place or you guys, but because I felt like it was in good hands, and boy, it was. So many good things happened over the summer. Uh, I understand camps went well. The uh, volunteer dinner went well. Adult VBS, first time we'd ever done that, that was a smash. So I was glad to hear that. And uh, just the Life Group Expo went well. And there are people that have accepted Christ this summer. People have been baptized. We baptized a young lady in the 9 o'clock service this morning. And so many, many good things, and it, and it proved my theory, and my theory is this, anytime I'm away, the church does better, <laughs> and I think that when Rob and I both are away at the same time, it really does well, and uh, I think that's just God's way of saying, hey, I got this, I don't really need you, but you're included, you can join along if you want to, but he's, he's really good at being God and running things, so anyway, glad you had a great summer, it's great to be back, I'd like to begin this time of our service with prayer, would you join me in praying this morning? Father, this morning, we appreciate the privilege that it is to have immediate access to God, to you. At your invitation, you're the one who opened up the throne room. You tore the veil from top to bottom. You inaugurated a new covenant through your son, and you want us to enter in. You want us to fellowship with you. You want us to be in relationship with you. And out of that, you want to show us wonderful things, Lord. And my prayer is today that you show us maybe one or two of those wonderful things, Father. Help people in this room and those watching online to realize how much you love them. Man, if we could just get that one, that would be worth it all. But maybe speak to us today about faith, about what it means to follow you, Lord, what it means to trust you for us in our race that we're running, where we're at in life. God, show us uh, how to do that and do it well. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, clocking out for three months, uh, gave me the time to gain something, and the thing that I gained, I feel like, is perspective, perspective on some things. And so I turned 60 in one week from today. I know, I don't look a day. <laughs> anyway, but anyway, yeah, I turned 60 a week from today. Don't finish that sentence uh, or that thought. But uh, so, yeah, I've had, I've had three, about a 90-day period to reflect back on my 50s, what, what happened in my decade, and, and it gave me some time to think forward and uh, as I said, what it's given me is perspective. And here's what I'm not going to do. I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to throw it all on you. You know, this morning, he's like, Ugh! you know, I'm not going to do that to you. But I will share a few things with you that might be uh, helpful to you on your journey. And I'll share those with you over the next few weeks as we meet together. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, fantastic. That's what we'll do. One of the things while I was away, I sensed God saying is is teach on Hebrews chapter 12. And so that's where I want to start this morning. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to look at verse 1. and So find that in your Bible or on your tablet. And let me say this about today's message. Today's message simply sets the stage for next Sunday. Uh, it doesn't mean that that's not important, but it's this, this Sunday builds to next Sunday. So be sure and be here or watch online if you would next Sunday. It'll make more sense, I hope, to you. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Here's what I would like for you to do. Count how many plural pronouns you can count in this one single verse of scripture. Plural pronouns you're looking for. Here we go. Therefore, verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with race, or run our race with endurance, the race that is set before us. Boy, I butchered that. 
But how many pers- or plural pronouns did you count in verse 1? How many? I got six. How many did you get? You don't, what's, a, what's a plural pronoun? Okay. It's the we, us, you know, they, them kind of thing. So how many do you count of those? I got six. That's how many I got. Think about that. In one verse of Scripture, it refers to more than one person six times. So that should tell us something. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a bit. But here's something I found interesting. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, what is the great cloud of witnesses? What is that? Well, they're actually found in Hebrews chapter 11, right? Now, in the United States of America, we have, we have halls of fame, don't we? We have the sports hall of fame. We have the country music hall of fame. In the Bible, you have the hall of faith. And it is basically Hebrews chapter 11. And it's not everybody, but it is a, 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 a group of people that represent those people that lived their lives, ran their race by faith. And so that's what I want to look at this morning. Turn back one page if you've got a physical book or go back one on your uh, tablet or phone to Hebrews 11.1. 1. These people entered, they got, they got put in Hebrews chapter 11 because they were known for something. And the thing they were known for was their faith. And so what is faith? So here's the definition of faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The assurance of things hoped for. Think about that for just a second. The assurance of things hoped for. I'm sure of what I hope for. Isn't that an interesting juxtaposition there? I'm sure about this, that I, well, this thing I hope for. I'm sure about what I can't see. I can't smell it. I can't taste it. I can't touch it. I can't hear it. But I'm sure of it. And that's what he's talking about here. You see, see the tension there. I, 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 can't, I cannot get this with any of my senses, and yet I'm sure that it's still real. I'm sure that it's still true. That's the idea of faith. He says faith is the assurance. It's being sure of what you hope for, the conviction of things not seen. Conviction meaning you have a, you have a steady state. You're, you are confident that this is going to happen. You are confident of these things. He's saying the author of Hebrews, I say he Could be she, we don't know. The author of Hebrews is unknown except for God and the author of Hebrews. They know who wrote it, but we don't. But whoever wrote this said, this is what faith is. This is how it's defined. And then this is the very next thing this person wrote. Said, for by it, men or women, people, the people of old gained approval. It was by faith that these people pleased God, right? And so uh, then in verse 3, interesting, he, this, verse, this person continues and says, By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared. Worlds, not world, worlds, plural. That's not a typo in the Bible. It's their own purpose. Question for you. Do you ever find yourself looking out at, a, at, a, in, at nighttime in the amazing universe, out in the sky and all those stars, and you know about all the other planets, right? I mean, we, we know from science that these planets actually exist in the universes and galaxies. And this is not a science lesson. I'm not a science man, okay? But the Bible is very clear that all of those things that got put into existence got put into existence by the God who spoke those things into existence. Look at the rest of this verse. This is incredible. He says, by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God. How did God do it? Did he build it? How long did it take him to build it? What did he use? What kind of material? He spoke it into existence. Stuff that did not exist, he spoke, and then it came into existence. That is the God that these people followed in the Old Testament. That is the God that you are now following, if in fact you are following him. That is the God of the Bible. So that what is seen was not made out of things which were visible. That's power. I can speak all kinds of things, but I can't speak anything into existence, and God can speak into existence whatever he wants. And he has, and he does, and he's not finished. There's more. So that's interesting. These people please God in this particular way. Now, jump down to verse 6 with me if you would. Still in Hebrews chapter 11, it says, And without faith it is impossible to please him. It's impossible to please him. What is something that's impossible? What does impossible mean? I can't get, to, is it, can't get to church on time. Is that, I mean, is that an impossibility? No, what, what is impossible? It means that it can't be done. We can't do it. It's impossible. We can't please God without our faith, right? 
And again, before you get down on yourself, you're like, yeah, I know, I'm, I'm not very good at this Christian thing. I'm not very good at following God, and I feel bad about myself, and I, I don't have much faith, and what little I have is weak and all that. Let me give you a definition of faith for your, on your outline. This is the only fill-in today. Faith is trusting God to make good on his promises from an eternal perspective. That's kind of just a paraphrase of what Hebrews 11.1 1 says, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, Faith is trusting God to make good on his promises from an eternal perspective. You can do that. It's possible for you to do that. It's possible for me to do that. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in the Bible. It wouldn't be something that we're encouraged to do if we couldn't do it. You can do this. You absolutely can do this. And so he's saying, and and here's what we're looking at today. The definition is trusting God to make good on his promises. So here's my question to you. Do you trust God to make good on his promises from an eternal perspective? Yes or no? Depending on who you are, depending on where you are, what season of life you're in, how old you are, your, your faith background, those kinds of things, that would determine how you answer that question. Some of you might say, absolutely, yes, yeah, absolutely. Some of you have grown up in church or you were saved early, you accepted Christ early in life, and you've been in Sunday school or Bible study, you've been to church, worship services, and you've been taught. Some of you went to Christian school or Christian universities. And so for you, your faith is like breathing. It's like drinking water. It's just who you are and what you do. And so for you, faith is it's solid. It's Yeah, I believe every bit of it, everything in the Bible. I believe it's true. And do I understand it all? No, but I do believe it. And then there are others of you that are like, I'm not even sure what I believe. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't even know if I'm a Christian. In fact, I'm pretty sure I'm not, but I'm checking this thing out, and so I'm trying to figure this out for myself. And some of you are like, yeah, I believe God. I trust God. The promises are true. Most of them, or some of them, or some of the time. But sometimes I wonder, and I have, anybody like that in the room, anybody watching online that you kind of go, yeah, these ones I'm really good with, but that one or those three or whatever, I'm really not, I don't know. I don't know what I believe about that. Anybody like that? Nah, you're not going to raise your hand. What would people think of you? My goodness. My guess is there's probably a whole lot of people like that in this room and those watching online, right? And it's okay. It's all right. Let me ask you this question. What is it necessary for you to trust God to make good on his promises? Faith. That's kind of an obvious. Yeah. It takes faith. But is it important for you to know what some of those promises are in order for you to have faith in those promises? What does it matter what he promises you if you don't know what they are? I'm asking. I'm back. I'm telling. I'm back. <laughs> Sitting there and just kind of putting it on, you know, neutral is not going to work. You, you got to interact with me or I, I'm not, I can't do anything up here. So what good is it to have faith in promises that you don't know what they are? Not, not, they don't help you that much. It doesn't change the promises, but it changes your experience of those promises. So faith's kind of important. That's why he says it's, it's impossible. And it's not like God is this unpleasable God. He's just like, oh, man, I, nothing you do. I don't care about what. You know. No, he loves you. And he even gives you the faith to trust him. He gives you what you need to trust him to make good on his promises from an eternal perspective. But where would we find God's promises? If I was going to find any of them at all, where would I look? Where would I look? Wow, y'all are sharp. The Bible! This is why Pastor Rob and I try to encourage you week in and week out to read your Bible. Not because we get paid more if you read your Bible or you know it does something for us, but it does something for you. You need to know what God's Word says because that's what builds your faith. And you can't please God without that faith. And so you see how this works. And so you read these promises of God and you go, well, God promises it. Well, let me stop right there. Let's do a little audience participation here. What are some things that God promises his children in his word? You didn't know there was going to be a test today, but there is. What are some things that God promises in his word? Everlasting life. That was answer number one in the first service. Absolutely. What else? Say again. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And then he left. What was that about? (laughs) Is that true? Yeah, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. 40 days later, he was gone. But he sent somebody, didn't he? Somebody came back in his place. Who came back? Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is with every single believer all over the world for all of time, around them and within them. 
So when she says, Jesus said that he'll never leave you nor forsake you, that's exactly what he meant. And he will not leave you or forsake you. How important is it to know that promise? Got another one on you? A mansion? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Danny, she's not going to be disappointed. She's not going to be disappointed. Anything else? Does he promise comfort, encouragement, strength? Provisions, any of this coming back to you? These are the promises. These are things that God promises you for the journey that you are on. And they are given from him out of love, and we receive them by faith. And so it's important to know what they are, to be familiar with them, so that we can have the assurance of things, hoped for the conviction of things not seen. Let me ask you this. These promises that we're talking about, the ones you know of in the Bible, how confident are you that they're true? Hmm. It's easy to say, yeah, you, but how confident are you? Do, do you have the assurance that they're actually true? Do you have the settled kind of confidence that, yeah, I, I know this is, this, this is going to happen. I know this is how I feel. I know this is what it looks like, but, but this is what you say, God. Do you have that kind of conviction? Do you have that kind of, yes, this is going to come through? Do you have that? How do you get that? By learning what these promises are. And saying, God, this is what's going on in my life, but this is what you say. I'm going to go with what you say, and I'm going to do what I can, my part, and I'm going to trust you for the outcome. And then you step into that by faith, and you trust him to do what he says he's going to do. And guess what he does? He does what he says he's going to do. That's exactly right. Does he do it the way you want? Maybe, sometimes, sometimes not. Does he do it when you want it? Sometimes, sometimes not. But your experience of the truth doesn't change the truth. He promises that he will do these things for you. Did you know that he rewards the people that seek him? What? Yeah, keep reading. Same verse. And without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. How would you come to God? By faith. He or she who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. How does this work? You seek, he rewards. You seek him, he rewards you. That's how it works. That's what he says. It's right there. And then he gives this litany of people. He gives example after example. He says, here's what this guy did. Here's what this guy did. Here's what this guy did. And so he starts talking here, and, and he's listening. He starts with Noah there. Actually, before that, he started with some other guys. But think about Noah. If you know anything about Noah, he was in the Old Testament a long time ago. Noah lived in a desert, and God comes to him and says, God, he says, Noah, build a big ship. Build a big boat out here in the desert where it's never rained. Do you think that took any faith? Probably so. Probably so. Every day he shows up, he's gathering materials, he's looking for stuff, and it took him a long time to build the ark, didn't it, Cindy? A long, years and years. And every day he's out there in the desert building a boat. People are laughing at him. His family thinks he's nuts. I mean, there, you think it took faith to trust God to believe that God would make good on his promises from an eternal perspective. Do you think that took faith? Probably so. Abel, hey, I'm sorry, Abraham. Abraham, he says, Abraham, hey, leave your family, pack up and go away. Go to a country you've never seen before. You don't know anything about it. I do. Just go that direction. I'll tell you when you get there. You think that took any faith? Absolutely. Sarah, you, you're, uh, you're way too old to get pregnant. You can't conceive any children, but you're going to have a son. What did Sarah do when she heard that promise? She laughed. And a year later, she's bouncing Isaac, baby Isaac on her knee. Her son came right? Moses, take my people from Pharaoh, the most powerful nation in the world, take them through the sea to the promised land. You think that took any faith? It uh, took a lot of faith, absolutely. And so faith is what? Faith is, back on your outline here, it says it is trusting God to make good on his promises from an eternal perspective. And I know what you might be saying to yourself right about now, yeah, Scott, that's true, but you know, Abraham did big stuff. Dave, King David did big stuff. You know, Sarah did big stuff. Uh, Noah built a big boat. I mean, these are big people doing big things. I'm just trying to get my September rent paid. I'm just trying to make my marriage work. I'm just trying to keep my kids out of trouble. I'm just trying to get a date. I'm trying to get out of a date. I mean, it... <laughs> 
it's so easy to look at these people in the Bible and go, yeah, those were people that were like, you know, shit, that was Superman and Wonder Woman. And, no, these were just people. They lived their lives by faith. They trusted God in their time for the things that they had to trust God for in their times, right? And, and what I would say to you and me is that what, why is this in the Bible? I mean, if it's just about superheroes and what they did in their time and it had nothing to do with us, then why, are, why is it in the Bible and why are we talking about it this morning? Is it possible that maybe what they did had some connection to what we do? What they faced has a connection to what you face. Is that possible? It is, and the connection is they had to live by faith, and you have to live by faith. You get to live by faith. You get to trust God to make good on His promises from an eternal perspective, right? Here's another question for you. Do you think life for Noah was extraordinary each day or ordinary each day? I suspect it was probably ordinary. I think he was an ordinary man living in his time in the world. And he had a family, and he was doing ordinary things. And his family was doing ordinary things. And this extraordinary thing came to him, this extraordinary task, this ask from God to Noah. Same thing for Abraham, same thing for Sarah, Rahab, David, all the people that are listed there. They lived ordinary lives, and then one day God asked them to do something that was kind of extraordinary. It seemed big to them. And I don't know about you, but maybe you can think about it in your life. Most of your, day, your days, are they mostly extraordinary or ordinary? ordinary? They're very ordinary, aren't they? I mean, sometimes boring. But they're very, very ordinary. So what is the connection to those two things? I think that just as those people had to demonstrate faith in God for the everyday ordinary, that's what got them ready for when the extraordinary, the big ask came. Jesus said it this way. He said, pray this way. Pray for your daily what? Your daily bread, daily. Why? Because it's, or, it's daily stuff that you need and he wants you to recognize that he's the source of the daily things in your life. And even that takes faith. It takes faith. And then every once in a while, God may come to you, maybe once in your whole lifetime, he might come to you and he might ask something big of you. It'll be big to you, but it's not big to him and it's important to remember that. And he already knows what he's going to do. He's not like, I'm going to ask you, and then I'm going to, I don't know, we'll see what you do. He already knows what you're going to do. You don't know what you're going to do. But it's going to take faith for you to trust God to act on what it is that he shows you. I remember when Kim and I were first married. We'd been married a year. We were living in Arkansas. We'd lived our whole lives in Arkansas. And God said, pack everything up and go to Fort Worth. You need to go to seminary, talking to, my, to me. And so we put everything in a Hertz Penske truck, which wasn't a lot. And, and we took off, and we didn't, we didn't know, we had no family in Fort Worth. We had no friends in Fort Worth. We had no, no neighbors, no jobs, no leads, no nothing. We had a little bit of money, not much. And we showed up, and the very first day we got there, we were eating lunch at an Oriental restaurant, and there was this young couple, Robert and Sharon Pinkston, and we befriended them, and we started talking, and Sharon goes, hey, you know, I have this job that I work, and maybe you could come. And Kim applied. She worked there the whole time we were in Fort Worth, or three and a half of the four years. And God provided the whole time we were there. But for us, at that time, it was a big ask. It was hard to leave everything we knew and go somewhere like that. I think about the church. I think about this church. And the times that God has come to us as a church, and he said, hey, buy property. You're on these two lots. Buy this 20 acres out here. Oh, yeah, and it's going to be $3 million to build this building that people don't want. I mean, he's asked us to move, change name, change bylaws, change polity, ordain elders, ordain deacons, hire staff, build budgets, you know, and for the future, there is more things. It's all, it always takes faith to trust God to make good on his promises, right? And the way that you get ready each day is that you basically trust God for the, for the ordinary things while you're living your ordinary life. And, and I know it's very easy to say to yourself, you know, Scott, um, well, I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Let me jump back here. Let me say this about faith. Uh, these people ran their race, and this is another way of saying, you know, living by faith is running your race. And, and it's interesting because if you look at this, this if chapter 11 is a, it's story after story, person after person who trusted God by faith and great things happened. Good things, they overcame things. They shut the mouths of lions and they overcame kingdoms and all that kind of stuff. And, and it's all good. It went well, we would say. And then you come to these, verse 35. It says, women received back their dead by resurrection and others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. 
And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated. People of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. They had a tough time. But these people in the hall of faith, they had faith in God and their faith helped them persevere all the way to the end of their race. They trusted God in the good times and in the hard times and God got them through to the end. The context of the letter of Hebrews, this book was actually written, the book of Hebrews was actually written to Christians in the first century who were following Jesus and they were being severely persecuted and tortured because they were following Jesus. And the writer of Hebrews, realizing that, wrote to encourage them and say, hey, you know, look, look back, look at history, and you will find that all these people live by faith. And they went through a lot of stuff too, but they made it all the way to the end because they had faith and God saw them through to the very end. And you might be sitting there saying to yourself, thanks for the history lesson, but last I checked, we're not being sawn in two in this country. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not under any death threats. I mean, I'm, I'm not being tortured or, you know, Tempted murder on my life as a Christian. I, I'm not living in a hole in the ground or a cave or whatever. So what does that have to do with me? To which I would say, I hope it's, I'm glad it's not that way. A, I hope it never comes to that in our lifetime. I don't, I don't know. But here's the thing. Do I, how much time do you want me to spend talking about how dark the times are that we live in? And the direction that we're headed as a nation and as culture. Do, you, do I need to spend any time at all unpacking that? Of course I do not. You, you know that because you live in the same world that I do. And the time may never come that you need that kind of faith. But here's what I would say to you. How do you get ready to live for the future? It takes faith. And it's the faith that you are demonstrating on a day-by-day-by-day day by day basis in God, meaning you're trusting God to make good on His promises on Tuesday, on Wednesday, at work, at home, at school, on the playground, Right? on the team, on the, wherever you're at, you're trusting God by faith because he's going to make good on his promises. And as he does, when you see him make good on his promises, it just strengthens your faith all the more, all the time. And this, is, this becomes the way you live your life. It's not like, yeah, I read this one promise or I know two or three and yeah, I saw God come through back in the 90s, you know, whatever. But no, it is a living daily thing and your faith is getting strengthened day by day by day and you will be prepared for whatever comes your way. These people, it ended well for them because they put their trust in God. They didn't have their eye just on this life down here. And so let me read this to you. We're almost done. I skipped this in the first service. I'm going to give it to you. This is talking about Abraham. I'm in verse 9, Hebrews 11:9. 9. By faith, Abraham lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. Who were Isaac and Jacob? Son and grandson. You have three generations, and the way they understood it was they lived in tents. They were nomadic. They lived, they, they were, but by faith, they were following God. They were trusting God. They understood that their time on the earth, which was a lot longer than ours is, Back in the day they lived, but their time on the earth was short. It was just, a, it was just they were exiles passing through. This is very important. If, if you don't get anything else in this message, I hope you get this. Verse 10, for he was looking for the city which has as its foundations whose architect and builder is God. What is the point of that? That's the assurance of things hoped for. In other words, these people lived in such a way that they didn't put all of their stock on this life and this world. They understood that they were living for something beyond this life, something beyond right now. That is a hard concept to get the younger you are. The younger you are, the harder that is to understand. It's harder to believe because you're just trying to, you know, you're trying to figure your life out. Depending on where you are, what age you are, it's very hard to think in terms of eternity. But what I'm saying to you is, what the author of Hebrews is saying is, the way that you get ready for eternity is you don't wait to get ready for eternity. You live your life in such a way by faith that you trust God to come through on his promises in this life. And that builds hope in your life so that as you get older, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, I could call for people right now and say, Danny, darling, since you volunteered earlier, has everything in your life turned out like you thought it would? 
<laughs> Are you kidding? Right? Bonnie, has everything turned out like you thought it would in life? Did, did you have any curveballs and surprises? Did anything come that you, you, were, you weren't expecting to happen? Did you have an idea where you wanted to be when you were however old you are? Old? But you, you had an idea how you thought life was going to be and it was going to turn out and you were going to do this and it's going to work out that way. I'm telling you, every person that I know that has a little bit of gray hair can tell you life doesn't go like you think it's going to. No matter how hard you try, how well you plan, it turns out different. And the way that you get through it without getting undone by life is that your faith in what God says is what sustains you. From an eternal perspective. You get the eternal perspective by looking into his word and trusting what he says he's going to do. Man, I'm telling you, when you get this down, it doesn't matter who's in the White House, brother. It doesn't matter who does this, what the economy does, the price of a gallon of gas. I mean, those things matter, but they don't matter in the big picture. Because the big picture is you're living by faith in a God who promises to bring you home. And to take care of you in this life while you're on your way. And you have to live by faith, trusting God to make good on his promises from an eternal perspective. And it turns out really good for us. Last thing and we're done. Look at verse 39 in chapter 11. And all these, the people in the hall of faith, all these having gained approval through their faith did not receive what was promised. They did not receive what was promised. Did God change his mind? Did God do a bait and switch on these people? What in the world? He answers in verse 40. There are the answers in verse 40. Because God had provided something better for, not them, for us. Who's the us? Who's the, that's us, right? What is the better that God provided for us? Jesus Christ. All those people lived by looking forward to the Messiah coming and they never saw it. In their lifetime. We look back at what the Messiah has done. He's already come, died, resurrected, ascended. He'll come back a second time. We're looking back at what Jesus did. These people were looking forward, right? And so he says, because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect or complete. Their salvation is made complete when Jesus came, right? And, and because they were looking forward to what Jesus was going to do and we're looking back, we're all together in the same family. There's a connection between those people and us. I promise you, you're connected to Noah. You're connected to Sarah. You're connected to Rahab. You're connected to King David. You and I are connected because that's what the Bible tells me. How? I don't know. What's it going to be when we get home? I don't know. How's that going to go down? I don't know. But it is going to happen that way, and we're connected to them. We are family. I got all my brothers and sisters with me. You thought I forgot, didn't you? Does it blow your mind that you're connected to Joshua? To Samson? Deborah? Mary? You are. You're also connected to Billy Graham, Charles Finney. John Wesley, I mean, we are all part of that same group. We're all in the same thing together. We're in this family and we live by faith. So we finish out where we started today. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. In other words, that great cloud of witnesses ran their race by faith. And now they're waiting for you to get home. They're watching you. I don't know how. They're applauding you. They're pulling for you. They live by faith. It turned out well for them. They ran their race looking forward. And now you're running yours. And they're saying, you can do it. You can do it. And it's worth it. It's worth it. Because God always makes good on his promises from an eternal perspective. I told you as we got started this morning, today sets the stage for next Sunday. Don't miss next Sunday because next Sunday we're going to really get after it. Today's just getting you ready for that. Let me pray for you. And let me say this to you. If you're a person here and you're, you're saying to yourself, you know, Scott, this is cool, but um, I'm not sure I'm in the race. You're talking about this race and faith and all these things and I'm, I'm not sure that that's 
that I'm in the race at all. And, and the truth is you're not if you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Jesus is the key to the race. And the way this works is simply this. Jesus came and he died on the cross to pay for your sins. Your sin separates you from God. It keeps you out of the race. Jesus died and rose to pay for your sins. And your faith, your faith that he gives you is the assurance that that's true. And so what you need to do today, or you watching online, what you need to do is ask Jesus by faith to come into your life and save you. And that's exactly what he will do. So I want to lead you in a prayer. The prayer doesn't save you. Jesus does. But if you want to accept Christ as your Savior, pray this prayer with me. Not to me, but from your heart to God's heart. He's listening to you. And he will save you. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, you are God's son. I believe in you. I believe that you came to this earth. You died on a cross to pay for my sins. Thank you. I receive your forgiveness. I accept you as my savior. Come into my life. Make me clean. Help me to follow you by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. That's how I got saved a long time ago, almost 40 years ago. I, I was in a church service like this, and I asked Jesus Christ into my life, and he came, and he changed me. And I've been different ever since. So if you sincerely prayed that prayer and you meant that from your heart, that's exactly what Jesus did. He came into your heart. And in just a couple of moments, we're going to do something in this worship service called an invitation. And here's what's going to happen. We're going to start singing a song together. And, and some of our staff and elders are going to come down front and they're going to be here for you. They're going to be here to encourage you. They're going to be here to help you know what to do next because you need help with those kinds of things. We all do. And so take advantage. Don't be afraid. Don't worry about who's here. Don't worry about what so-and-so is going to think. Respond as the Lord is drawing you. As you feel that little tug, that sense of, I need to go forward, go forward. And this is for the rest of you. The rest of the invitation is on your outline. And I'm going to go through it real fast. Here it is. Look up for you. If you're a Christian, look up and realize that you're a part of something bigger than yourselves. Boy, that gives you hope when you realize that your life is not just about you and this world is not all there is. That's the point of this today. So look up. Look in. Are you running the race by faith? Are you running your race by faith? What are you doing by faith? What are you trusting God for? And right now you might be going, well, I'm, I'm sail smooth sailing. Everything's cool. But it may be that something's coming that you you got to be trusting God. you got to be getting ready for, Right? I believe that's true for our church. We'll do that together. And this last one, look out. Look for opportunities to live your faith and in so doing, promote curiosity of the people around you. This is great evangelism for the Christians. If you're a Christian, one of the best ways that you evangelize is as you go through stuff, people stuff, money stuff, marriage stuff, health stuff, and you go through it and you don't freak out and you don't curse God, but you go, you know what? This is hard and we're struggling and I'm crying, but I'm crying out to God and God's coming through for me. He's making a way. He's fulfilling his promises. That is evangelism to the people around you that are watching you go through those things. They need to know a, a source of strength greater than themselves. And you have that. And his name is Jesus. And so that's your evangelism for those people. The same side of the evangelism coin is also true. As you're going through life and life's going well, as you're blessed... As, you, as you're experiencing God's favor and good things are happening and doors of opportunity and your business is succeeding and all these things, you don't take credit for that. You don't go, look what I did. No, you recognize that every good and perfect gift comes from God. And you give credit where credit is due. The reason I'm so blessed and my life is so good is because God is so good to me. It's your faith in Him. And that's your evangelism. You share the good things with people too. And as they watch you flourish, they want in on that. And that's part of the evangelism. That's a lot of things to think about. So here's what we're going to do in this invitation time. We're going to stand. We're going to sing.
if you've accepted Christ as your Savior or you want to, or you want to pray for some faith, or you want to pray for somebody else in faith, this is your time to respond. Let's respond.